Good afternoon. Welcome everyone. I am Diggy Ritchie and I welcome you to a new lecture on poetry analysis. Today I'm going to be examining some works by Emily Dickinson, including a very challenging poem, which is part of the prescribed list for the Independent Examination Board of South Africa. Emily Dickinson is undoubtedly one of the most mysterious, gifted and fascinating poets in the English language. It is ironic and sad to consider that she saw only six of her poems in print. She often sent poems to friends, she enclosed verses in letters, but only six poems saw the light of publication while she was still alive. In 1886, after Emily Dickinson's death, Dickinson's sister discovered a heap of manuscripts in a bureau. Many of them had been sewn together into little packages obviously Dickinson thinking of clusters of pages in a book. Dickinson's poetry presents editors and critics with huge problems, often because she listed variations in her poetry without specifying exactly which lines were her final choices. And of course, her punctuation is, for many, notoriously eccentric. The poet Ted Hughes commented, that the eccentric use of dashes is an integral part of Emily Dickinson's poetic method. But many editors prefer to change those dashes to colons, semicolons, commas, and full stops. It was only in the mid-1950s and early 1960s did the scholarly editor T.H. Johnson release complete volumes of Emily Dickinson's works, volumes which he felt were as close as possible to the poet's original intentions. There are 1,775 poems in all. She was an astonishingly prolific poet, a very difficult but very rewarding one indeed. She was born in 1830 in Amherst, Massachusetts, and in her girlhood she was noted for what we would call her quirkiness, her dry humour and her unconventionality. She famously described herself as being small like a wren, with hair the colour of a chestnut burr, and in a wonderful image she described her eyes as being the colour of the sherry that guests leave in the glass. There's extraordinary pathos as well as beauty about this description. She was the daughter of Edward Dickinson, a lawyer and the treasurer of Amherst College. She herself studied at Amherst Academy and at the Mount Holyoke Female Seminary. A bit of a tongue twister that. But her formal studies ended when she was 18. She said of herself in her school days, I am one of the bad ones. She withdrew, she became almost completely reclusive and she wrote her poetry in the cupola of her home in Amherst. She read extensively, though. She is steeped in the Bible, Shakespeare, and Protestant hymns. Their influence upon her works is obvious. Perhaps harder to establish is how much she was influenced by the metaphysical poets and by the great founding father of English Romanticism, William Blake. And it's important, I think, to look at these two influences upon her writing. The metaphysical poets were a group of 17th century poets whose focus was largely on religion, philosophy, spirituality, the flesh, eroticism. The most famous metaphysical poets include, of course, John Donne, it's D-O-N-N-E for those of you who don't know, and Andrew Marvell. The metaphysical poets are probably most renowned for the use of what we call, by the rather strange name, conceits. C-O-N-C-E-I-T. A metaphysical conceit, of course, has nothing to do with vanity. It simply means a rather far-fetched comparison. Or it would be more accurate to state, a comparison that seems far-fetched and unlikely, but when examined closely, when explained by the poet, it becomes startlingly apt, strikingly appropriate. 
William Blake, of course, is famed for his expression of profound philosophical truths in deceptively simple language and teasingly ambiguous symbols. Blake's songs of innocence and experience often have an almost childlike melodic quality, but their imagery and their ideas are by no means childlike. Let us glance quickly at one of William Blake's most famous poems. I shall be reciting it from memory. It is called The Sick Rose. O oh, rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Now clearly this little poem, devastating little poem, is about the destructiveness of concealed desire. But there are so many mysteries about it. Why the invisible worm? Why the howling storm? Is the poem also about the inevitable vulnerability of beauty that exposes itself to danger and threat? Is it dealing subtly with the vulnerability of women to men? The worm is clearly a phallic symbol. There are all sorts of interesting mysteries about it. And yet the language, when you consider it, is very simple. There are very few words that an average reader would not understand on a first reading. And that is the joy and the challenge of reading William Blake. It is also the joy and the challenge of reading Emily Dickinson. However, before we examine some of Dickinson's poems in more detail, I would like to share with you a biographical passage and a commentary on her work, which I found in a wonderful collection entitled Women's Poetry from Antiquity to Now. It is edited by the Barnstones and it was first published in 1980. And I do feel that when one finds a really magnificent passage, all one can do is quote it. It is quite a lengthy passage, but I'm sure you'll find it fascinating that I'm reading you extracts from it. In the cupola of the Dickinson house, she began to write the first of 1,775 poems, which were to be the centre and the obsession of her life. In 1862, she sent four of them to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, an essayist and a contributor to the Atlantic Monthly. She asked the older author whether her verses breathed. Higginson was incapable of classifying or judging her poetry. His response was indecisive. Actually, in a letter to a friend, he declared that her verses were not strong enough to publish, quote, unquote. By her third letter to Higginson, her one formal tie with the publishing world, she had clearly accepted her destiny as an artist who in her lifetime would remain unknown. But publication and fame were not unimportant to her, as her many poems on the theme of public failure reveal, beginning with the early, success is counted sweetest by those who near succeed. Two other men were important to Emily Dickinson, Benjamin Franklin Newton and the Reverend Charles Wadsworth. Newton was a companion, a reader of unorthodox literature, the friend who taught me immortality, quote, unquote. In a letter about Newton, who died in 1853, she wrote, My dying tutor told me he would like to live till I had been a poet, but death was much of mob as I could master then. A year after Newton's death, she took a trip with her father to Washington. While in Philadelphia, she met the Reverend Charles Wadsworth, who was 40, married, and pastor of the Arch Street Presbyterian Church. Emily Dickinson was 24. She fell in love with him. I cannot live with you. It would be life, and life 
is over there. Thereafter, she dedicated a part of herself to him. She was to see her dearest earthly friend. Six years later, in 1860, when he called on her in Amherst, and then not for 20 years until one day during the summer of 1880. From the age of 25 until her death in 1886, she kept increasingly to herself, seldom leaving the family residence. She dressed only in white, what she called her white election. Death on May the 15th, 1886, from Bright's disease, was the last in a series of deaths whose nature she had observed and terribly understood as no writer of her century. Emily Dickinson knew the Bible, Shakespeare, Protestant hymns, the rhythm of the hymnology is in her poetry, yet her closest kinsmen, perhaps, are the English metaphysicals, whom she probably knew little of. She spent the greater part of her life in one house, writing in one cupola from which she saw the world. She imagined places that she knew from almanacs and maps. She played with concepts of time, death, love, eternity, in metaphors which she made up with iron wit. She was outrageous, irreverent. She ordered her symbols with curt authority. In brief or expansive verse, she felt at moments exhilaration, the arrow over the mountain. But more often, she was reflectively observant of both repressive external circumstances and the boundaries of the soul, whose immortality she could imagine but not believe. Her dark vision then was one of flawless courage, for throughout her life she followed the discoveries of her pen into occasional brightness through the hue of despair. But she never faltered in her mission of describing what she called her certain slot of light. That is, I think, a magnificent passage on Dickinson and her works, and a passage which I simply had to share with you. Like William Blake and the metaphysical poets, Emily Dickinson often writes very aphoristic verse, and it is important that you understand what an aphorism is. It is spelled A-P-H-O-R-I-S-M, and the adjective is aphoristic. An aphorism is a very short, pithy expression of a profound truth. When you read an aphorism, you think, yes, that could not be better put. And Dickinson, like Blake, is certainly a master of the aphorism. Think of such memorable lines as, after great pain, a formal feeling comes, or the soul selects her own society, then shuts the door, or a life that tied too tight escapes will ever after run, or drowning is not so pitiful as the attempt to rise. These are extraordinary devastating aphorisms, and made all the more devastating by the tone that Emily Dickinson often uses. It is an ironic, detached tone, bittersweet and self-mocking. At times it reminds one of the tone of Sylvia Plath, one of Emily Dickinson's great successes, and who was certainly influenced by Dickinson's poetry. But the time has arrived for me to look at a couple of Dickinson's poems. I've selected two, almost randomly, and then I shall look at the poem which is prescribed by the Independent Examination Board of South Africa. What do you make of this very brief, it is almost a squib, this very brief poem? Faith is a fine invention. 
when gentlemen can see, and see is italicized. But microscopes, also italicized, are prudent in an emergency. I'll read it again. Faith is a fine invention when gentlemen can see, but microscopes are prudent in an emergency. It is such an interesting little poem because it suggests that when people are thinking clearly, probing deeply, then one can create philosophies, doctrines, systems of belief. But how often do we see really, clearly and wisely? And therefore it is important to use science and to gaze very closely through microscopes at reality. For those of you who might think that Emily Dickinson is dismissing faith there, dismissing philosophy, that is not true at all. She celebrates the probing imagination and profound thought. But this is a wry little warning that sometimes we have to observe reality very, very carefully. Sometimes we have to look at facts. We cannot always rely on the certainty of belief because human beings do not always see clearly enough. The suggestion is they can be blinded by arrogance and fanaticism. And all of this is implied in a few short lines. Here is a slightly longer poem, one of my favourites, and a very distressing poem indeed. Consider the tone of the opening line. I like a look of agony, because I know it's true. Men do not sham convulsion, nor simulate a throw. The eyes blaze once, and that is death. Impossible to feign the beads upon the forehead by homely anguish strung. That dry, disturbingly detached tone is certainly present in, I like a look of agony, of extreme pain and suffering, because it is true, there is no pretense about it. And then she generalizes, men do not sham convulsion. Convulsion, the sheer pain of that spasm, cannot be fate, and nor can one put on or pretend a throw, and that throw is spelled T-H-R-O-E. It means a death throw, the last signs of death. The eyes glaze once, dramatic dash, and that is death, dash, as if she is simply filling in, in parenthesis, that reality. The eyes glaze, and then it's over. That's actual death. Impossible to feign, impossible to act. And then the last two lines, the beads upon the forehead by homely anguish strung. It's impossible to pretend and to act out the beads of suffering, the drops of perspiration upon the forehead. But look how brilliant those lines are, the extraordinary use of startling conceit. The drops of perspiration that indicate pain and death are described as beads, as if they are beads of an ornamental necklace. They are strung upon the forehead. And then that absolutely extraordinary adjective, homely. Homely means ordinary, mundane acceptable. So what is Dickinson suggesting? That the coming of death, the existence of pain, all part of reality and should be accepted. Anguish, extreme pain and suffering. Anguish is holy. It is part of existence. And at the end of our lives, ultimately, we will all be ornamented with 
the beads of suffering and death. And notice we shift from agony at the beginning to anguish. Agony suggests more physical pain and suffering. Anguish has spiritual and psychological connotations as well. It is a devastating little poem because it is inviting us to look with clear eyes at the reality of suffering and death and see it as part of existence and even an ordinary part of existence. Homely anguish streams those beads of perspiration upon the foreheads of all human beings. This would seem an appropriate point at which to end what is essentially an introduction to Emily Dickinson, her life and works. I've looked at two poems that are not prescribed, but in the second lecture on Emily Dickinson, I will look at the poem that is prescribed by the Independent Examination Board of South Africa. It is entitled, The Wind Begun to Rock the Grass. And I look forward to speaking to you again.